The native plants we all know are from this region. We want native plants here, right? It's what we need, provides food, habitat, oxygen, all those things. Everyone know these two photos? Yellow water lily, very common. And we've got um, com common cattails there. The non-natives, we know they're from other parts of the world. Very, very few, if any, predator relationships to control their growth. So we have these huge explosions. Top picture, anyone know what that one is? Purple loosestrife, right? So, aside from beekeepers, the bees do really like purple loosestrife, but for the rest of us ecologists, it's not something we like to see. It forms these dense monocultures and really, really can wipe out the native plants that we really want to have in the marsh systems. Anyone, can anyone name the second plant? That's parrot feather. Got a couple more pictures of that down the road. That's kind of what used to be a very common um, plant in the aquarium trade. Let me summarize this, the non-native plants introduced to a lake or pond, I will guarantee you will always become a problem, become widespread and cause major issues. However, just to clarify some of the terminology, the native plants or the indigenous plants, they can also grow to nuisance densities and require some management. A great, ex and a lot of times that's because of our, our inputs, right? So nutrients and, and things that, that are related to human activity. Here's a good example of that. This is Mossert's Pond out in Clarksburg State Forest, way in the northwest corner of the state. Um, the fo this was a completely open water uh, lake. We have a swimming beach there, campgrounds, you know, canoeing, fishing, um, you know, good recreational use, good fishery. Over the years, that picture on the left there, I mean, that, those all native plants. That's primarily water shield, which is similar to a water lily in some regards. It's a floating leaf plant. And there's some water lilies mixed in. But those are all native plants. So hopefully we could all agree in the room that when it got to a level like that, even though it's a native plant, it's behaving badly and I would consider it an invasive at that point. Once we get start getting beyond somewhere in the range of 40% coverage in a water body of a native plant, like in this situation, it starts becoming an issue, might warrant some management. So the picture on the right, that's the same lake, same view. The first phase of the project we did there is to start removing some of that native plants, get some biomass out of there, create some open water and some edge effect habitat there. The method we use there is something called hydro raking. So this is a mechanical method, um, really effective for plants like lily pads and, and water shield that have a, a good root structure system, a, a large rhizome. Essentially a floating backhoe driven by paddle wheels. You got usually an eight foot or so York rake on the front and you physically pull these plants out by the root system. Uh, works pretty, it's pretty effective, it's kind of slow going. Could do maybe at the most of one acre per day with one of these machines. But as you see the picture on the right there, we opened up some lanes and uh, it was pretty effective. So a lot of the impacts, again, a lot of stuff covered by Amanda. As scientists, we really worry about the change that they have on the system as far as species richness and diversity go. Um, but recreationally, you know, so like these photos, you've probably been on some lakes like this with topped out invasive plants. Basically makes fishing impossible, boating impossible, and we basically lose a lot of our um, native plant population. How do all these things get here? A lot of you know, but there's several methods. I mean, back before there were stricter regulations, ship ballast water, you know, from different regions of the world, you know, especially coming into the Great Lakes region and introducing um, new invasives to the United States. Um, accidental or in intentional release from aquariums or, or water gardens. So the picture there is um, kind of typical. We've run into some situations where we've, you know, seen folks dumping aquariums and with, if there were any invasive plants in there that they bought at, um, not, not just Petco, but any place like that. Now we've got an introduction. Um, or mix in with other plants. You might buy some native plants. Um, you know, I've been seeing lily pads for sale, right, in the water garden industry. There could be some invasive plants mixed in with those shipments. And once we've got them here, how are they spread? Number one, I've seen some pretty good talks um, that show at least 75, some even say 90% of the spread of these plants is overland transport on trailer boats and recreational equipment. Um, but a lot, some of the critters we're dealing with have a microscopic stage and uh, bait buckets and live wells in a boat, cooling water for boats, you can all spread plant fragments or microscopic um, plants and animals. By fragments and water currents, a lot of people, and it's a really simple concept, a lot of folks kind of forget about that. They spend all kinds of time and money managing invasive plants in their lake when the lake directly upstream 
is really the source of those plant fragments. So without addressing both of them, you, you really could, will never be able to get multi-year control. And then occasionally by wildlife. So it's certainly possible that wildlife can spread um, these invasive plants around. I'm gonna go through a handful of like the common invasives that we had, deal with in Massachusetts. This fella here is Barry Hillquist. He literally wrote the book on plant identification in the Northeast and North America for that matter from uh, North Adams, Mass, MCLA, doing some hand pulling of water chestnut there. Two of the most common, Eurasian milfoil and variable milfoil. I'm sure some of you have heard of them. Widespread throughout the state, probably the number one plants that we deal with in Massachusetts. Eurasian milfoil tends to be more common in the western part of the state, the alkaline waters in that region but we do find it in, in Eastern Mass as well. Variable milfoil, on the other hand, I, I honestly can't think of one lake in the western part of the state that has an, a really infested lake with variable. A couple occurrences here and there, but um, for the most part, it, it doesn't seem to like those alkaline waters out there, calcium rich, high pH um, lakes that we have in the western part of the state. So here's a, one of our lakes, Lake Kachichuit, up in Natick, Massachusetts, actually in three towns, Natick, Wayland and Framingham. So the photos here, that's Eurasian milfoil, topped out in probably 15 feet of water. This is probably the most heavily used state park, the first large lake system outside of Boston, probably a total of 700 acres of water, you know, public boat ramps, fishing, stocking programs, public swimming, um, etc. So at one point in this lake, I mean, we, we were up to probably 150 acres, I'd say, Folks that don't know what an acre is, about a football field. So, I mean, a pretty substantial area. And as you can imagine, um, these lakes are really deep, so we'll always have open water in the middle. But the entire littoral zone of the lake had become infested with the Eurasian milfoil over the years. So, we've gone through a whole host of management techniques out there. And we'll, I'm going to cover, I'll try to cover all of them real briefly, just so you know what, what's available out there. But if you look in this picture on the right, you see the lifeguard chairs in the back and a little bit of open water there in front of the beach. Um, is a non chemical method we can use, which we've used in Lake Achichuit quite often. It's labor intensive, slow going, small areas, what's called diver assisted suction harvesting or DASH. There's quite a few companies throughout the Northeast um, that do this work. It's, I've done it myself. It's labor intensive. It's a long day underwater. So um, literally, it's still diver hand pulling. The divers are still pulling the invasives by the roots by hand, but feeding them into the suction hose, as you see at the right, on the right. It's just really a more efficient way to get the plants to the surface instead of just filling mesh bags all day underwater and going back and forth from the boat to the bottom. And then on the left there, that's one of our contractors over at the Wachusett Reservoir. That's a real typical setup of DASH. It's a, basically a modified pontoon boat with a big pump on there. And um, the divers feed the plants into the hoses. Up to the boat they go and into a mesh collection bags for composting later on. So like I said, certainly not a lake-wide solution. This is something limited to several areas. The largest area I think we've done is, was this one back here in front of the swim area and that was about five acres. Probably took a month just to do that and we still had some substantial regrowth in that but most of the time it's fairly effective depending on the substrate type. Uh, a couple more. Fanwort was a very common aquarium plant, likely how it got here. Spreads real easily. It's very brittle. All these most of these non-native plants spread by fragmentation. So essentially a small piece of the plant gets chopped by a rope propeller or uh, gets brought in on a trailer or um, fishing gear or whichever way it gets there. One very small piece can float along, grow what we call adventitious roots, sink to the bottom and start a whole new population. So fanwort's a tough one and widespread in the state, very expensive to control. Curly pond weeds, another one there. Folks that take my plant ID class, that's what we call the lasagna noodles. So here's an example of fan wart. And unfortunately in this situation, just for budgets and uh, priorities elsewhere, this one, the technique used to manage it is the no management technique. So that's actually a possibility. If, uh, if there's no way to do it, the photo on the right is just a close up. Um, you can see it's fan wart from the bottom all the way to the top of the lake. And on the left, that's a hundred acre lake. And if you look closely, it's in flower there. That sort of haze you can see all the way across. I mean, it's a hundred football fields of 100% fan wart coverage. You know, and at this point in time, it's just not something we have the ability to manage. So keeping in mind, we're discussing management techniques. The no management is also an option. Uh, European Naiad, another one 
real common in Western Massachusetts. This one really needs those alkaline waters I talked about. Uh, really common out that way. Uh, can cause quite a mess. Uh, water chestnut's the next one. That's an annual plant. I would never use the word eradication on any of these invasives. We'll make it pretty clear. Any lake that gets invaded by one of these non-natives will always have to be managed to some extent. There is no eradication. I would never use that word. With water chestnut though, it's the only one that I might use that word because it is an annual plant. So here's Fisk Pond. That's up in Natick again, part of that Kachichuit State Park system. That's the southernmost, but the upstream source to that large Lake Kachichuit system. So you can see there, that lake is about 70 to 75 acres. And you can see on the, on the left there, I mean, that's what we we're dealing with year one. So, so some pretty before and after pictures I took there. Um, you know, looks, looks like it was a simple project, but I mean, we, we, here's what we were doing. Mechanical harvesting and hydro raking every year for years, and we're still doing it. So, the very first year we did the mechanical harvesting, we took out 225 tons of plant material, so it's a lot. But year two, we were down to 98 already. Year three, in the 30s. Year four, and so on and so forth, we continued to go down. Now we are able to get it done with a couple days of hand pulling with volunteers or paid staff to go out there in small john boats and pull what plants are left. Each one of those water chestnut plants can put, it's an annual plant, but one seed comes up, puts that rosette on the surface, and at the end of the year, I mean, really left alone, you, that one plant could produce up to 200 uh, new nutlets in one season. So you can see how quickly it can cover a lake. Um, this project is literally six figures a year. So over the course, we're, we're a good half a million dollars into that project. The moral of the story is we don't want to get to that point, right? So knowing the difference on these, how to identify these plants, you find them early. That's something that we always preach, early detection and a rapid response you've probably heard of. Um, that's why we do go around and do a plant ID class. A lot of folks will not understand what kind of how harm that plant would do when if you just hand pulled that very first plant from the surface, you, you would not run into this situation, right? But a pretty good success story, S significant funding. Not many lakes have that kind of money. Or, or time to, to throw at it, but it is possible. Mechanical harvesting is basically um, using these giant aquatic lawn mowers, and all the seeds, they're very large, nuts on water chestnut. Um, so basically, we drive this machine over the surface of the water, collects all of those nuts with the rosette, and basically now we allow sunlight to get to the bottom, a new batch of seeds will germinate, which they can, these stay viable in the sediment for well over 10 years. Some scientists are saying even up to 15 years. So the theory is though, you harvest one batch, let sunlight down, the next batch germinates, we harvest that, the next batch germinates, and so on and so forth over the course of years. You can maybe get to the point of eradication. These are some species of uh, plants from considered new infestations, sort of rare in the state, but basically these are some of the number one on our most wanted list or most hated list, if you will. These are the ones we really want to look out for. A lot of the plants I just talked about, we have a significant problem with already and widespread. The last thing we need are new species to deal with, right? There's a parrot feather again. It's a pretty plant. That's why it was an aquarium plant. The only place that's been found in Massachusetts have been backyard type ponds where someone's probably planted things on purpose, dumped an aquarium, planted some lily pads with some fragments of this plant mixed in, and you've got these messes in these sort of backyard ponds. Those, those, the only two that we found, those have, been, those have been managed and treated, and um, at this point, we don't know of any other locations in Mass with parrot feather. South American waterweed, uh, Egeria densa, only three known occurrences that we've found in Massachusetts. One, again, was a backyard type pond, which was been, has been managed. Actually, it was the same lake that had all kinds of other strange things in it, obviously placed in there by people. We've got one lake in the central part of the state that is, we just discovered and surveyed last year, um, did scuba surveys. Yeah, pretty much 100% coverage. 
uh, we're starting to work on the plan. That's the first widespread one we found. The other one was this place, Lake Rico. That's over in Taunton, so down the southeast part of the state. Um, another example of management there. This was interesting. This was definitely someone introduced this plant somehow. This is a really accessible point by the public right at the spillway there. It's all clear. A lot of people fish there. Just looking over the side there, there was a gear densa, the South American water weed, starting to really take off just in that corner. It just happened to see this stuff, right? It wasn't on a typical sort of routine survey. But I mean, left alone for that whole summer, we really could have seen an explosion in growth. So that was as simple, once again, just knowing what to look for, that EDRR, early detection rapid response, I was able to just notify conservation what the situation was, get in there with some snorkels, um, hand pull the plants as carefully as possible, trying to, not to make fragments, and then put this stuff down there called benthic matting, which is just basically aquatic weed mat. It's, so it's negatively buoyant. So you try using the stuff from Home Depot, you'll have a heck of a time trying to get it to the bottom, trust me. Um, that's specifically designed for aquatic use. So we put a couple panels in there in case I missed some of the roots or missed some plants here and there, and that was to block the sunlight. Pretty simple, just like terrestrial plants need uh, sunlight to photosynthesize. So um, we cut the sunlight off from them as a prevention. And um, surveys to this day, that was some years ago, have yet to see that plant uh, come back. So. Early detection, can't stress that enough. Hydrilla, this is this one, uh, this is a big deal, hydrilla. It's uh, one of the more aggressive plants, you know, it's really dominated the southern part of the United States, southeast area, really rapid growth. And one of the key descriptive properties you'll see here, 50% of the biomass occurs in the top half meter of the water column. What that essentially means is 100% coverage, a huge mess it makes, and it goes really quickly. Massachusetts, these are the only known locations. We've got about five of them now, and you'll notice that all but the Clinton location are all in your neighborhood around here, right? So um, oh, on the Cape, we've got Long, Long Pond down there in Mystic Lake, but you've got right down the road, Magoon Pond in Marshfield. It's actually in three of the ponds in the chain. Pembroke, uh, you've got Hobomock Pond. And now we have South Metal Pond up in the central part of the state. All of these are actively being managed, right, by us or by the town. So we found these locations and we jump on them quickly. Rapid response, and those are all getting, getting treatments. I'll talk about in a minute. This is the, just an example of how bad this hydrilla can get and how quickly. This is uh, South Metal Pond up in Clinton. This is actually right outside of the main public access to the lake. So there's a state boat ramp there. Most likely came in from who knows where, maybe down on the Cape or somewhere. And there it was started right at the boat ramp. You can see how thick that stuff is. I mean, you can't even paddle this the canoe through there. And then this is just looking the other way. You can see the plant just literally creeping across the, the entire lake there. So you can see the line up in the top part of the photo that still has open water. Fortunately, but this is the point that we found it. We had acres really widespread through all there's about six lakes connected there Every single one of them had some hydrilla in there um, I, Like I said around that boat ramp area where it was introduced was really dense So, you know you get to that point with a plant like this we, we don't we can't do those diver techniques or anything like that It's just physically impossible. So you've, you're left with the aquatic herbicides, right? There's a typical type of treatment, Florida Everglades style airboat. Um, that way there's no prop to chopping up the plants. I mentioned how that makes the situation worse by spreading fragments. And also you couldn't physically drive a boat through that stuff to apply the herbicide. So that's really the tool that you need. And you know, there's that stuff sonar. Uh, Fluoridone is the active ingredient, really common one. That's a systemic herbicide. So there's systemic and contact herbicides for those of you that have ever used chemicals. Whenever possible, we will, in state park system, we'll always use systemic herbicides. Much more expensive, however, they do kill the root system. So we can get several years of control and we can really go in there with a large scale treatment and then over the next few years follow up with that diver work or the benthic matting and that type of thing. We've had some really good success with that method. Doesn't, sometimes it takes a couple of years of treatment in a row um, to get there, but it usually does work. Here's another situation, just more, more uh, examples of different type of management techniques. Here's that Hydrilla Lake, Mystic Lake, and Barnstable. This was a really good attempt and a classic example of early detection rapid response. We had a consultant working with this lake association who is very knowledgeable in plant identification and was out doing a basic water quality survey 
and noticed this, some hydrilla growing and said, you know, whoa, we know how bad this stuff is. So a great organization down there can show what can really happen with volunteers. Basically what you see or what we've done, the buoys are, surround, are floating a mesh net, which is weighted to the bottom. And we basically mapped out all the hydrilla beds, surround those with the mesh netting. And then we've got volunteers in there with heavy garden rakes trying to get the whole root systems out and then using canoes as transport barges to get the plants back to shore. And then to, so we get this stuff out and then the next step there, here we are installing those benthic mats again, that bottom weed mat. So we, we clear an area with the rakes and inevitably you miss some of the plants or you don't get all the roots. So in the known areas, we cover them with benthic matting. Textbook example of trying to get at the stuff quick before getting into huge expensive herbicide treatments. Unfortunately there, I don't have a great, it was not a great ending to the story. It was a great effort over a course of a whole summer, all volunteer work. Looked like we got rid of all the plants, um, but the next, the next year, um, water clarity was excellent due to a whole nother situation. Um, uh, a pre preventive type treatment for cyanobacteria blooms, which increases water clarity, which allowed more sunlight down. And the next year, the hydrilla exploded. Um, it was all over the place. So in the end, this lake ended up being treated and is currently still managed for hydrilla. But just another example, it was a great effort and um, way to get out there and, and work together. Again, the state park system, we're actually out there managing funding and managing aquatic plant management programs in a lot of our public water bodies throughout the state. The other thing we can do though with volunteer groups and lake associations, we do a, a free plant ID training. So we literally will bring plant samples to you, to your group, to a location, do an actual workshop, teach folks how to identify these plants down to genus level and even species level at some point. Uh, they get a lot of, uh, a lot of folks, we've had a lot of what we call saves just based out of that program folks and calling us hey i found water chestnut in such and such a lake and we hand pulled it out you know boat ramp monitoring our program unfortunately got cut way back we're down to very few lakes now some of the real busy boat ramps especially in western mass where we worry about the zebra mussel spread we have actual paid state staff at the at the boat ramp checking boats coming in and out checking fishermen make sure there's no plant fragments hanging off their equipment and that's paid staff, you know? We just don't have a budget for it anymore, so it's a tough deal. Most lakes, you really need to have volunteers to cover that. And we, we've got tons of outreach materials. If anyone has a need for things, boat ramp signs, we've got brochures, handouts, floating keychains with Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers logos, those type of things, you know, all free to the public, so feel free to reach out if there's anything there that you think might be useful. Another example is our boat, one of our boat wash stations. Pretty simple. For the plants though, we don't have to worry too much about the boat washing, right? Some plant, it, yeah, it doesn't hurt. You can get some of the fragments off, but with all the plants, it's really a visual inspection of equipment, right? And just removing those the actual fragments. This hot water wash is really specifically for zebra mussels. Uh, it's a hot water and we kill the larval stage. Um, as folks exit that lake, which is Laurel Lake out in Lee, Massachusetts, which is infested with zebra mussels. And things that you can do and tell other folks to do is, you know, clean, drain, and dry. That's the national message. If you don't have drying time, then it's clean, drain, and decontaminate, right? So we have cards that have uh, several methods that you can make sh pretty sure and be confident that you've uh, killed off any of the critters we're worried about. It could be hot water things like vinegar, bleach solutions, etc. And I monitor the lakes in your watershed. It's really important. You know, can't stress it enough. Finding this stuff early, you really have, have a chance to save the day. So getting trained, monitoring, being out there and looking. And for folks that didn't know, it is the law in Massachusetts now. We did manage to get a law passed a couple years ago now. Um, actually 2013, I believe. We finished at the end of the year, 2013. So previous to this law, it's called an act protecting lakes and ponds from aquatic nuisances. And it covers the, the transport of plants, whether native or non-native, you know, from one body to another. So whether you're coming to a lake with equipment that's contaminated or you're leaving a lake, you can be held uh, accountable now for that and be fined and, you know, have equipment towed and that sort of thing. So the environmental police know all about this now and uh, just bring it to everyone's attention. And thank you very much.